Good evening, everybody. We might make a start. Um, I've been told I have to keep everybody to time tonight. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see such a large audience for our presentations tonight. I'm Alexandra McCarthy, head of the School of Nursing. Um, and tonight we are actually going to hear about the inevitable. Uh, ageing is something that none of us can avoid, but I'm sure we're going to hear some very sound advice tonight as to how to deal with it the best way that we can. We've got a very, very stellar lineup for you tonight, starting with an overview of what um, ageing currently looks like in New Zealand. And then we're going to move into the intricacies of sight and hearing as we grow older and um, conclude with a discussion of the consequences for our generation in particular of um, living longer. I think the alarming thing about the presentations tonight is that we are the first, and with the rising obesity um, in all Western countries, probably the last generation to live as long as we are going to. Um, so we're here tonight to actually understand how to make the best of it. I'm going to, um, in the interest of time as well, because the presentations are going to be very captivating, you'll have a lot of questions, but we'll save them for the end. Um, where we'll have a little bit of time to actually take a few questions from the audience. And we're going to start with a brief word from Sue Brewster, who is Executive Director of the AMRF. Where is Sue? Oh, there you are. <laughs> My side's going. <laughs> Off to the side. Oh, look, good evening, everybody. As introduced, I'm Sue Brewster, and I'm the Executive Director of Auckland Medical Research Foundation. And I'm really, really delighted with how many of you have turned out tonight. We are a bit worried when we saw the weather. The rain does tend to put a few people off. So thank you very much for coming out. And the range of presentations tonight are going to be all worth your while. So a big thank you. Um, I think the topic tonight is a subject dear to my heart. Uh, my mother lives with us, and mum is 85. And um, funnily enough, I met up with Cliff this week, and um, I was talking to Cliff about mum, and he said to me, well, is, is your mum 85 years young, or is she 85 years old? And I think that's a really good distinction, because I think ageing well and living well uh, for an older population is all key to that quality of life. Um, so, and on that note, I would lo like to pay special tribute um, to Emeritus Professor Kay Ibbotson, who passed away on the 12th of July at the age of 91. So um, for those of you who know Kay, um, an extraordinary man who lived life well and made um, amazing advances in medical research and um, in, in all of our quality of life and health. So special tribute to Kay. Um, but look, once again, and um, I think from our perspective, I would love to thank all of our supporters here tonight. Um, I think since 1955, we've funded uh, $71 million worth of medical research in uh, the greater Auckland region. So it's only you supporters that are here tonight that have made that possible and I guess continue investing in the quality of life for everybody. So a massive thank you. Um, I really know you'll enjoy tonight's presentations and I will hand back over so you can enjoy the lectures. Thank you. Oh, hey. Thank you, Sue. Um, our first speaker tonight is Professor Alastair Woodward, fresh from Barcelona. Um, Alastair is a public health medicine specialist who graduated from the University of Adelaide and has studied and worked in universities in Britain, in the US, and obviously in New Zealand. He was the first head of the School of Population Health after its move to the Tamaki camp campus. He works on environmental health issues such as air pollution, physical activity and climate change and is presently head of the section of epidemiology and biostatistics. Of particular relevance to tonight's lecture, he recently published a book, The Healthy Country? Question mark, a History of Life and Death in New Zealand. So please welcome Alistair. Thank you very much, Sandy, uh, and it's great to see the lecture theatre full. Wonderful. Um, the, the topic for tonight is the social revolution that we face as a consequence of uh, the population living longer. 
Um, it really is a, a revolution because it's something that's happened that's unprecedented and I believe it's going to have implications for every aspect of our life. Um, we've got a section on the data to start with because I, I think that uh, many people don't appreciate just how substantial the changes are that have occurred, how significant they are, just what the consequences are going to be. And as a result, I think people either are sort of not aware of what's happening or they are frightened by it because they don't understand it fully but think it may be leading us you know, into a new ice age. Um, uh, it's important to understand what's happening in order to appreciate the challenges and I think you'll see tonight that there certainly are challenges in front of us. But it's not the ice age that's coming over the horizon. Um, there are new opportunities as well as a consequence of people living longer. And as I'll make the case, not only living longer, but living better, living healthier for longer than they have in the past. So that's my job, really, to um, tell you a little bit about uh, the basis for this social revolution and other speakers are going to talk to you about some of the implications, the clinical implications, of um, this enormous change in survival and demographics. Now, this, as you know, is part of a series of um, lectures celebrating 50 years at the University of Auckland Medical School. Um, and uh, those 50 years have seen enormous change. Um, here we have the class of 68. Um, now, I, wasn't, I didn't graduate from the University of Auckland, as Sandy just said. Um, and I'm not quite old enough to have been in the class of 68, but close to. Um, and one of the things that uh, was drilled into me as a medical student around this time um, was that the job of medicine was to add life to years, not years to life. Uh, and, and the basis for that was the view that um, the human lifespan was more or less fixed. You know, the, the Bible had laid it all out as it laid out many things a long time ago. Three score years and ten was what you could expect. And indeed, that was what people were living. Uh, and uh, it wasn't going to change. Uh, and so the job of medicine and the healthcare system generally was to ensure that you got as much quality in that 70 years as you possibly could. I was told many things in medical school that were subsequently proven to be absolutely wrong. <laughs> and that was one of them. Uh, because that's not the way it's turned out. Uh, and I think it's really important that we appreciate how it has turned out uh, and just what the implications might be. So here we have life expectancy at birth. Uh, this is for men. The pattern for women is similar, but um, uh, not exactly the same. In New Zealand, um, going back to the 1940s. But if you have a look at 1968, or roughly where 1968 might sit on this graph, um, 1965, 1968, here, uh, and the New Zealand um, uh, non-Maori is the green, Māori is the purple. Let's just look for the time being at the non-Māori life expectancy. So look at the green line here. So what was happening to male life expectancy in New Zealand in the 1960s and early 1970s? It was, it was not changing, was it? And it's about 70, or a little bit under 70. Uh, so that was why my lecturers said to me, you know, we've got three score years and ten, that's pretty much where it's going to sit. But look what happened subsequently. You know, the line's going up, 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 up. Um, and uh, for the non-Maori men in New Zealand, life expectancy now is about uh, 80, a bit over 80. Uh, it's very close to world best for men which is the blue line at the top, and it is nudging ahead of the Australian figures. Not that that matters in the slightest. <laughs> uh, 
Now, the story of Mari is different, and I'm going to come back to that shortly. But the point I wanted to make here is that um, what appeared to be uh, the picture in 1968 when this medical school got going, appeared to be the case in the early 70s when I was a medical student, um, is pr proven to be uh, quite wrong. And instead, uh, we've added 10, 15 years of life expectancy on top of what applied in 1968. Indeed, as I'm going to show you, just as a rule of thumb, a way of thinking about it, in recent, um, uh, in the last 30 years, New Zealand has added um, three years of life to every, de every decade. So every 10 years, life expectancy has gone up by three, three years. Almost the same as, you know, every day uh, getting another eight hours of life. You know, you end the day and all of a sudden you've got eight hours more in front of you than you did before. Um, so that is extraordinary. Uh, what could possibly cause it? Where is it leading us? Those are the sorts of questions that you know, follow. Just to give you a sense of what I talk about when I talk about life expectancy, which is um, you know, a statistical term, it's a convenient way of summarizing mortality across the lifespan. Um, here I've got death rates by age in 1901 and 2011 uh, for New Zealand. And um, the 1901 graph is the one at the top here with the fainter line. And the 2011 is here, showing that the curve has been shifted to the right. And the peak that applied in 1901 in infancy, when mortality rates were extraordinarily high in the first year of life, has reduced enormously. You know, one of the enormous great achievements of the last hundred years is overcoming infant mortality. <laughs> life expectancy is LE, that's what it stands for, that's the average years of life lived. And if you remember, I'm not sure if you remember um, statistics, some of you may have studied it at some stage, you know, there's a difference between average or mean and median and mode. So median means the 50th percentile. So halfway through the distribution. And mode, what does mode mean? Most common. Yeah. So you can see um, the life expectancies, or the average, has gone up from 57 to about 83. That's in the space of 110 years. Uh, the median, so that's what 50% of the population could expect, has gone up from 66 to 86. And the most common age at death uh, now is uh, into the early 90s. So the difference between the mean, which is the average, and the most common uh, is important if we're thinking about the implications for healthcare, amongst other things. Now, um, I said that life expectancy is a way of sort of condensing into one figure uh, a quite complex picture. And just to give you a sense of the complexity, I'm showing here the mortality rates for the most common causes of um, death in New Zealand. Cancer, ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease or stroke, chronic lower respiratory disease, which is sort of pneumonia. I mean, they are the major ones. <clears throat> and this is, again, going back to the sort of end of the Second World War, um, uh, taking us up to the current day. Uh, and you can see that in each instance, um, these deaths from these diseases have fallen. Um, from cancer, many people don't appreciate that, but we're seeing substantial year-on-year -year improvements in um, cancer mortality. Cardiovascular disease, look at that. You know, when I was a medical student, we were at the peak. Um, and indeed, that was the reason that male life expectancy had stalled, because we were going through the at the peak of the epidemic of heart disease. Since then, since, the, um, since I graduated, <coughs> mortality from heart disease has fallen by over 80%. It's really changed the world of medicine and healthcare. And all the other causes that you can see there, um, I think without exception, have reduced. 
So when we talk about a social revolution, a healthcare revolution, um, you know, we're looking at this picture where the world is different to the way it was. Now, um, the question of how far we can go, you know, is this going to continue? Um, this was the question that got Tony Blakely and I interested in writing the book that Sandy referred to, The Healthy Country. Um, uh, because for 80 years, New Zealand non-Maori were the healthiest in the world. We were highest average life expectancy, 1860 to 1940. Um, nobody had written about it before or looked very closely at it. Uh, so that was the impetus for our book. Um, but you can see the, um, the line here, the straight line is drawn through world maximum average life expectancy, which has gone from 45, so the healthiest population in the world had lived on average for 45 years in 1850. 160 years later, you've had 40 years added to life expectancy. 40 years in 160. Um, that's the same as three months every year um, being added to life expectancy. And, and the, 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 the remarkable thing about it is that it's linear. You know, it's just going and going and going and going. So for individual countries, of course, there have been perturbations. And that's apparent in the colored graphs there that show for different countries the effects of flu epidemics, of world wars, um, of other disasters. But in terms of what humans can aspire to, uh, at present, we don't know what the limit is. Countries like Japan, which are the longest lived in the world, um, still, year on year, their mortality rates are improving. Mind-boggling. Now, the question of what the explanation for this might be is partly captured in this table, which shows you the age-specific contribution. So, which are the age groups that have been responsible for this remarkable improvement in mortality in New Zealand and elsewhere? And it began with infant survival. So to begin with, the top left-hand corner of the graph of the table, it was children, improvements in mortality in children that were responsible for driving increased longevity. But that's no longer the case. If you come across to the last 20 years, you know, mortality in childhood has fallen so far that there are not many gains still to be made. Where the improvement is coming from is reducing mortality in the elderly. And not just in what you might call the young elderly, 65 to 79, but the older elderly, you know, over 80. More than half the reduction, more than half of the improvement in life expectancy is now coming from reductions in mortality in, amongst people in their 80s and 90s. Now, there are some other things that um, were regarded as certainties that are not certainties. And one of them is this question of differences between men and women. Um, and again, I remember uh, being instructed that men were the weaker sex and that they wouldn't ex would never expect to live as long as women did and there was a five or a six year gap. Um, now, that as you can see here, is not fixed in concrete. Over time, the difference between men and women has changed and continues to change. As you can see here, the gap between male and female life expectancy in New Zealand is currently declining. Men are catching up on women. And we believe that's a consequence of several things, one of which is men were first to take up cigarettes and they gave them up earlier than women did cardiovascular epidemic has receded, and that partic bore particularly on men. The story is different for Māori, as you can see here. Um, uh, when statistics were first available, uh, Māori men lived longer than Māori women. And that was a consequence largely of the appalling uh, maternal mortality and mortality related to reproduction that uh, Maori women suffered at the time. Now, I'd like to just lean a bit on this notion of variations in life expectancy because the average very much hides 
uh, a spread, a wide spread of experience here in New Zealand. And this is important in terms of what we should do in terms of priorities and in terms also of what we could achieve. Daniel Sukalam is a, an honours student who worked with Dan Exeter and I last year. Um, and I had suggested that he look at life expectancy across the Auckland Transport Network. And so what Daniel did was to take the bus stations on the northern busway and the train stations on the southern side of the bridge and to look at life expectancy of the populations within two kilometres of each station. You can understand how that might be done. Um, and what he has shown is this startling variation within one city. As you travel from Albany to Otahuhu, uh, life expectancy falls 11 years. Now, it's not an even gradient. You know, you can see the colours are, are mixed up here. Uh, but the point I'd like to make is that we talk about an average of 82 years life expectancy that hides uh, an enormous variation, the Maori, non-Maori differential I've already referred to, but there are other differences in terms of socioeconomic status and in terms of other ethnicities. So this tells us that we have some work to do. People say, how could we live longer? Well, it's not a question, I believe, of technology or treatments. It's a question of working out how everybody in New Zealand could have the same experience as the people who live in Albany. Does anybody here live in Albany? <laughs> so what is it about it being in Albany that enables you to live so long? <laughs> the, um, the experience of Māori, I mentioned that is something that uh, is, is of great importance to us here in New Zealand for many reasons. Um, it's a very sad history in terms of the effects of colonisation and loss and deprivation on Māori health. Uh, they started from a long way back. It wasn't any of their doing. It certainly wasn't biologically determined. It was a consequence of our, our history. Um, the good news, um, so that's the bad news, that they were six or seven years adrift. The good news is that that gap is not widening and uh, we believe there's some evidence that it's narrowing. Here in Auckland, um, the life expectancy for Māori is increasing currently at twice the rate of non-Māori. Um, this was reported by Waitamata DHB uh, last year. So um, bad news, good news story, bad news that we have these gaps, good news is that they're certainly not fixed in stone, that they can be changed, and at least in Auckland they appear to be change, changing in the right direction. <clears throat> now, the big question um, when you talk about living longer is whether it's a good idea. <laughs> I mean, is this something we should really aspire to? Uh, and behind that it lies a fear of ageing. People associate it, I think, with loss, uh, with misery, with unhappiness, um, uh, with separation. But, of course, there's absolutely no reason why that should be so. Um, and the question of whether the improvement in life expectancy has been accompanied by an improvement in healthy life expectancy is a really important one. At the same time, it's a very difficult one to answer because what defines a healthy life expectancy? Um, it's easy enough, by and large, to tell whether somebody's alive or not, but to tell whether they're healthy or not is that something that people decide for themselves? Is that something that uh, um, you determine on the basis of a blood test? Uh, how do you do it? Well, this is work from um, the Ministry of Health. Uh, it's a bit old now, but it was a good stab at answering this question, which looked at um, years of life lived independently or years of life lived by, uh, in various ways, judged in various ways to be dependent. Um, and you can see here that uh, we're talking, uh, remember, I said about three years in every decade improvement in life expectancy, uh, a bit more for men than for women. Um, so that's the height of the bars here. And the proportion in blue 
is the extra years lived independently, not dependent. So good news, bad news story. Um, bad news is that uh, there is extra years of life lived dependently. But the good news is that they are outnumbered, two to one, by years lived with healthy, and a healthy life expectancy. So an extra, ten, an extra three years every ten, one of those three is lived in compromised health, two of those three is lived in good health. Is that a good story or is that a bad story? Um, well, I'm a, an optimist. I would see that as a desirable state of affairs. There are other indications that um, people who reach the age of 70, 80, 90 these days are in better shape than people in the past reaching the same age. That's important for cognitive decline, which is a, a major issue for us in terms of aging, um, where it's observed that in later birth cohorts, people born at later times, um, the frequency of cognitive decline, of dementia, um, of other mental conditions of that kind is lower than it was previously. So it's not to say that we can turn back the effects of ageing, but the effect is less amongst individuals of a certain age now than it was in the past. A, a good way of describing this is this remarkable man, Don Pellman. Um, so, uh, this is two years ago. Um, uh, he uh, repeated the uh, achievement of Jesse Owens. You may remember Jesse Owens at the Berlin Olympics. He broke four world records in the space of an afternoon. Um, that had not been done again until Don Pellman fronted up at the Masters Games in 2015. And he broke four world records uh, in the space of an afternoon in his age group. His um, age group was 100 to 104. <laughs> he was born only two years after Jesse Owen. He's a contemporary of Jesse Owen. Uh, and uh, So um, my point being, obviously he's an extraordinary man, but there's a bigger picture here which says that... Um, People are living longer, and they're generally living longer in better shape than they had in the past. Now, why would that be? Um, uh, I'm not going to go into that because I've almost used up my time. But I, can, I, I think we can point to some important things that have happened recently, you know, since 1968, uh, which have contributed in terms of having a better environment, enlightened social legislation, and as I've already mentioned, better medical care. What's missing in this picture of the Southern Motorway? <laughs> well, it's different in many ways from how it looks these days, I suppose, but you might notice um, the uh, very effective median barrier that's <laughs> located here which was introduced, by the way, as a consequence of agitation by the doctors in the emergency department at Auckland Hospital who were fed up with having to deal with the damage resulting. Um, so, you know, just an example of environmental changes that have occurred. And what about social policy? You know, could you imagine travelling like this in an aeroplane? It was once the way we went, got around. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned here, a truly smoke-free childhood, once a rarity, is now commonplace. So, you know, there have been huge changes in um, the world in the last 50 years, and it's not too difficult to draw the dots in terms of how those changes have led to the kinds of improvement in survival that I've talked about. And maybe we can pursue that later in the um, question time, if, if you like. Uh, where are we heading? I think we might get to a century of life expectancy by the end of this century. It's a, a, a daunting thought, maybe. But uh, as you can see, if con present trends continue 
uh, we're likely to have life expectancy for women of about 95, which means you'll have a 50% chance, women born in that, uh, in 2000, 2100, of getting close to 100. So, I've more than used up my time. This is what I want to tell you. Um, average life expectancy increasing by about three months every year. That is absolutely remarkable. It's earth moving. It's, uh, it's social revolution indeed. Substantial social inequalities. Don't forget that map of the Auckland Transport Network, um, but some signs that they're closing. Healthy life expectancy is also rising. Two years of every three that we gain each decade is good life. Um, the causes, I've touched on that very uh, lightly, no sign yet of a slowdown. And if you've got a chance to see a movie and you haven't seen this one, go and see Michael Caine in Going in Style. Absolutely wonderful. You're never too old to get even. That's his message. Thank you very much. I wish we had an hour to listen to you, Alastair. That was fascinating. Thank you. Um, now we're going to delve into hearing um, as we age with Professor Peter Thorne. Peter is an auditory neuroscientist at the University of Auckland. He directs the Eidsell Moore Centre for Research on Hearing and Balance Disorders and is a co-director of Brain Research New Zealand, which is a nat national centre of research excellence that's focused on the ageing brain. He's published widely on cochlear pathophysiology and sensorineural hearing loss, and he established the Clinical Audiology Training Program at the university here. Peter contributes substantially to the hearing impaired community, and he was made a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2009. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, well, Alistair's given you a, a wonderful talk about um, life expectancy, and, and what I'm going to talk a little bit about is, I suppose, maintaining good health or some aspect of good health as we get older. And my area is in, is in the area of hearing, and what I was asked to do really was just to delve into a little bit of this story and particularly thinking about some of the impacts on, on cognition and, and some of the data which is coming out that suggests that hearing loss might actually be a contributor to uh, cognitive decline and potentially um, a risk factor or a modifiable factor for, for dementia. What I thought I'd do first of all was just to um, talk a bit about what our sense of hearing is. And I think that we tend to take our sense of hearing for granted. It's a very, very important sense that uh, we just perhaps don't realise what it's capable of and, and its importance. And in fact, if you go back to some of the writings of Helen Keller, and this is just a paraphrase from her, that it, the view that if, with hearing loss, and in this case, uh, profound deafness, actually cuts you off from people. So the issue here is about maintaining a connection with people. And I would just add to that, it also uh, separates you from your environment. And what I'd just like to talk a bit about is how important your sense of hearing is, not only to communication, but also to your place in the world and your connection with your environment. So perhaps this uh, whole idea is about hearing is really, if you think about it, is actually staying connected with, with various aspects of living. For example, it's really important in terms of learning and, and taking opportunities that might be presented to us uh, as, as, we, as we need to. It's about staying connected with each other, you know, through communication. And it's very importantly about staying connected to the world around us through awareness of sound in our environment. So we think about some of these different things and think about uh, hearing in terms of, of interaction and communication. Uh, we, can, we can understand this, the importance of it for social engagement, the importance of it for, uh, for emotion, you know, the, the, particularly that comes from that social engagement of, of enjoyment, um, the, you know, the issues of sadness, all the sort of emotions that might come through social engagement. Important key element to developing and maintaining relationships uh, to work and to learning. And I think this little image here of a, a young boy at school who has a hearing loss, in this case, uh, completely tuned out, just not able to, in this environment, uh, take part and is, is not clear what's going on. So it has a huge impact on, on, on learning. 
And we can all appreciate, I'm sure, how important our sense of hearing is into, into enjoyment and to emotional aspects of life. And whether we appreciate music, whether it be uh, a blues band or it's a, an orchestra, uh, the more these days, the idea of being tuned in to your iPod or your, your cell phone for hours on end listening to, to music or to, uh, to podcasts and so forth, but also just remembering the importance of being out in nature, listening to the whistling of the, of, of the uh, of birds or chirping of birds and uh, obviously you know, things like the rustling of leaves and so forth, which give a lot to our enjoyment of our life. But also our hearing is really important for awareness and for safety. So if you think about uh, your hearing system enables you to have contact through a three to a three-dimensional world, to environmental sounds that provide that, that real-world contact. And areas, uh, for example, in terms of safety, that being able to listen for warning signals um, are very important, uh, in this case in the sort of traffic environment, or even in your own home where you may uh, need to know about warning signals about uh, fire or so forth. It's very important for maintaining your safety. And one of the things about your auditory system is it never, ever turns off. You tune out, but it's always on. We don't, like the visual system, you have an eyelid. You can turn out, you can reduce the, uh, the light, but you don't have an earlid. Your system is on constantly, but it can be stimulated, it can, it can tune, tune itself down, but it doesn't turn itself off. So it's constantly uh, sensing the environment. The other thing we can just think about is obviously our hearing starts with our ears. I mean, that's where the sound is coming in. It's being detected and it's being passed into uh, nerve impulses that go to various parts of the brain, which are the auditory centers in the brain, which are responsible for detection of speech, analysis of sound for complex sounds. I just want to make this point here that we, you might not be aware, but you have two ears. Um, and they're very important that we have two, because even if you have a loss of hearing in one ear, you're actually quite seriously disadvantaged. But the other thing about our auditory system, and these are just showing the pathways here going from our ear through to the part of the brain and the auditory cortex out here on the temporal lobe, which are responsible for receiving all the complex information from our ears. But our auditory system is also connected with our emotion centers. It's connected with uh, our memory centers deep into the hippocampus, for example, which is very, very important for memory. So our system, our auditory system, is not just uh, dealing with, with, with uh, the, the, the uh, access to sound, but also the consequences of that sound to, 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 to life. And we also have a lot of interaction between vision and hearing and a lot of our different sensory systems. They're not all working independently. They're all working together to give us, once again, uh, an ability to sense our environment and to... Uh, and to communicate. So in many ways, we now know that through, by staying connected, we, and we might hear a little bit more about this later on, but by staying connected, and hearing is a very, very important part of this, you can sort of see, is we know that staying connected is very important for healthy aging, for brain health, that socialization, relationship with our environment. And additionally, now we know that if you have uh, a hearing loss as we age, that that has a considerable impact on your health and well-being. And I'll just go through some of these issues very briefly. So let's think about age-related hearing loss. Well, the uh, deficits in hearing uh, is quite substantial in our, in our population. And if you look at the, the, the uh, graph here showing the, the percentage of people with hearing loss um, in the population, it's really something for those people in, in older age, particularly over about the age of 50. And what you see is not only is that the amount of hearing loss is increasing, but also the severity. So as we get older, we're also becoming more severely hearing impaired. And so the impact of that on, on healthy living is, is quite substantial. And as Alistair was talking about, because of this aging population, there are some statistical modeling which is now being done to show that the, amount, the proportion of the population that might be having severe hearing loss will be rising quite dramatically over the next few decades. So what can we do about it? I mean, this is a, it's a very, very important health and, and probably a, and a social problem which we need to think about. We need to improve our awareness of the implications to general health and well-being, so it's not just focusing on just general communication. We really need ways to, to, to detect it, particularly amongst older people, to diagnose and provide those interventions early enough. Uh, and there's a number of things which we need to think about. You know, obviously, equitable and accessible services, 
limited disease and so forth and, and uh, access to technology. But particularly is around the sort of prevention and public health strategies which are really important to try and prevent the hearing loss. And for this at the University of Auckland we've now established a, a centre which focuses on research into hearing and balance disorders and this is a centre that includes a lot of groups around the, around the country. And uh, the focus of this is really to try and work with the clinical groups, with research groups and with the community to start thinking about how we can really develop um, uh, interventions and community uh, interventions in particular to reduce the, reduce the impact of hearing loss. So what is it, uh, just coming back to, to thinking about this relationship with healthy ageing, obviously from what I've been saying so far, keeping socially active, hearing is very important for that. Uh, I'll show in a few minutes that it seems to be particularly important around cognitive vitality and avoiding dementia. It may be particularly important in terms of avoiding injury so that you can be aware of, of warning signals and so forth. And so it seems to be tied uh, clearly to, to a lot of different aspects of trying to maintain uh, a healthy brain and a healthy ageing uh, as, we, as we age. And now we have another issue which is, has emerged from a number of uh, longitudinal studies which is showing that there is a link between uh, uh, hearing loss and cognitive decline in the development of dementia. And so if you look at some of the data that's come out of the US, uh, the risk of developing dementia increases uh, quite substantially, in this case close to a fourfold increase with severe hearing loss if, uh, when these people have been followed over time. There's been an increase in, in, in that. And how might this, what might this be related to? So we, there's a suggestion that maybe it's um, to do with changes in brain structure, which might be common across these two, the, the age-related hearing loss and cognitive decline. Perhaps a big part of it is that withdrawal, the social isolation that occurs, so that connectedness may have an impact. And there may be some uh, common fe features which are sort of common patholo pathology and pathological processes that affect both parts. And so it might be some sort of common mechanistic process which we don't fully understand yet. And just to show you that, some of the work which we've been doing, looking at um, uh, the auditory part of the brain, this part of the brain, which the cortex, which is associated with, with audition. Uh, if you look at some of the pathological changes which are associated with Alzheimer's disease, they're clearly present, for example, this particular protein tau and amyloid beta, which are proteins that are associated with, with the pathology of Alzheimer's, are clearly more present in, inside the, the auditory part of the brain uh, in Alzheimer's patients. And if you look at that, even the number of neurons inside the part of the brain which is actually involved in audition in, in uh, patient, people with Alzheimer's uh, is really severely reduced. So the, the uh, processes which are possible within the auditory brain are going to be severely compromised in people with Alzheimer's. And interestingly is that the part of the brain which seems to be more affected in Alzheimer's than the auditory part is actually in the left hemisphere, which is that part of your auditory brain which is associated with speech and language and pitch perception, which are you know, areas which are, are, are quite considerable within, with people with, with uh, dementia. We've got a long way to prove whether these are associated with the, or causative, but uh, at least we're starting to see that there are changes in the auditory brain. Another piece of work which we're doing is asking questions using our dementia prevention research clinics, which are part of the Brain Research New Zealand, a series of clinics right around the country where we're recruiting people who have early cognitive decline and following them over time. And we're investigating here under the direction of Suzanne Purdy here, looking at the sensory status of these people uh, as they enter into the clinic and asking questions whether these sensory changes might be maybe a biomarker, maybe they're early changes of of cognitive decline that um, may tell us something about uh, the, the progression for, for these patients. And just in that, just to sort of show you very quickly, uh, the data we have is that, yes, people with early cognitive decline against an age match controls, they show uh, difficulties in, in conversation, localising sound, poor processing of complex sounds, and they also show very poor processing of of motion within their, in the auditory, in their visual field as well. So it seems as if these are measures that are sensitive to changes and we need, now need to think about, and we're piloting whether we can perhaps train people in the auditory and visual domains to try and um, uh, improve the, the development of, of cognitive impairment. 
And just very, very quickly, I know I'm just sort of running out of time here, but very quickly, um, there is now, uh, the Lancet Commission uh, last year came out looking at the risk factors for dementia, and they have suggested that one of the most predominant risk factors or dominant risk factors is hearing loss. And that if you can treat that hearing loss, uh, as they suggest in early years, uh, the mid-years here, perhaps you can reduce the rate at which dementia develops. And so there is uh, a clinical trial going on now to look at the impact of hearing aids uh, on, con on cognitive decline, and we're going to wait to see the outcome. That's a very big study in the US uh, to see whether this has an impact, which will be very important for um, uh, the progression of these conditions. And just finally, there is a piece of work going on here uh, supported by the Health Research Council and um, uh, ma ma uh, led by Grant Searchfield in audiology. And what's interesting here is what he's looking at is um, if you're going to fit these hearing aids, you're fitting quite complex devices to people who might have cognitive problems. And so the devices are actually more advanced than the cognitive processing of the person that you're fitting them to. And so what he's looking at is if you actually alter these hearing aids so they have a very much slower cognitive processing power, will that optimize or, or improve the, uh, uh, the, the, the um, influence, I suppose, on hearing for, these, for, for people with cognitive problems? And so what I just wanted to try and show you is that, number one, hearing is very important for good brain health. It's very important for your well-being. We need awareness campaigns and, and we need ways to be able to provide hearing interventions which are equitable and accessible, as, uh, almost along the same lines as Alice was talking about. Strong prevention and public health programs to encourage people to use their hearing and remain connected. So as I say, look after your hearing and stay connected. It's maybe far more important than you actually realise. Thank you. you'll have many questions for Peter at the end of the session. Um, in the interests of time, we'll move on to Professor Helen Danesh Meyer, who is a professor in the Department of Ophthalmology. She's a clinician scientist, and Helen divides her time equally between patient care, surgery, and research. Helen graduated from the University of Otago and undertook her subspecialty training at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. In 2008, she was appointed as the Sir William and Lady Stephen Professor of Ophthalmology, making her the youngest professor in the medical school and the first female professor of ophthalmology in New Zealand. She is head of academic glaucoma and neuroophthalmology and the founder and director of the Optic Nerve Research Unit. She's also chair of Glaucoma New Zealand, which is a charitable trust that focuses on preventing blindness from glaucoma. Thank you, Helen. Good evening. That's not clicking. So I just use this. Where's the keyboard? Oh, oh. that's all right. That's okay, we can start here. Okay. Um, good evening. Ophthalmology is all about vision, and most of you will have at some stage feasted on, uh, visually feasted on masterpieces such as Rembrandt's uh, paintings, and perhaps even this one, which is The Blinding of Samson. The, the story is told that Samson had invincible powers, and he told the secret of his powers to his lover, Delilah. And that was that his powers came from the fact that his hair had never been cut since he was born. Delilah betrayed him and told the Philistines the secret. And so you can see from this picture, Delilah running away with his hair, and the Philistines pinning down Samson, getting ready to blind him. Now, several questions can emerge from this, looking at this painting. The first could be, why did Delilah betray him? But I would say the more important question is, why are they blinding him? Why are they not cutting off a leg or an arm or cutting out his to tongue? Why are they choosing to blind him? And that is because they wanted to inflict the greatest cruelty upon him. And blindness is considered to be the greatest cruelty. 
Um, and in fact, in 2016, when um, in the United States, Chapman University surveyed to look at what Americans fear, they found that they feared several things. 60% feared corrupt governments, 41% feared terrorist attacks, 35% feared Obamacare, and 47% um, feared blindness, saying that it was the worst possible health problem someone could go through. And when they explored this further, they found that blindness was ranked as the most dreaded health complaint, worse than memory, loss of speech, loss of a limb, or co contracting HIV and AIDS. And when they explored why, they said it was because blindness is associated with loss of independence and quality of life. And certainly this is an important issue as we age, because visual impairment increases as we age. In fact, 33% of visual impairment occurs over the age of 65. And if you look at this graph, you'll see that the, the spike starts about the age of 50. So what are the common causes of blindness? Well, there's cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes, and age-related macular degeneration. So what I'd like to do in the next 10 to 12 minutes is give you a, a historical journey through our understanding of vision, and then secondly, to focus on some of the research we have done at the University of Otago, uh, Auckland. <laughs> <laughs> One of the common threads that goes through both, both themes, historically as well as our research here at Auckland, is that research and progress is not made just through uh, advances in technology, but it requires fresh approaches and looking at things with new eyes. In the words of Marcel Proust, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So the research I'm presenting to you is part of a teamwork, and uh, these are some of my students who all four are now doctors and three are ophthalmologists. The research I'm giving you is an, an essence of the work that's been published in pa papers, so if you would like more details, please let me know afterwards. And I'll be focusing on the optic nerve, which is my area of research and arguably the most important aspect of the eye. So the optic nerve, well, initially the, our understanding of the optic nerve comes from Galen. And Galen thought that when one, someone wanted to see, spiritual humor was passed through the optic nerves, which he thought were hollow, onto what we wanted to look at. And then the soul returned this image into our mind through the optic nerves again so we can see. And in fact, this is where the concept of the evil eye comes from. So therefore, if the soul is looking upon something evil, the, the evil humor is then transmitted to the person, making them sick. So the optic nerve was thought to be halo, a hollow. And then in the 1700s, we had the invention of the microscope. And at that stage, despite looking at the optic nerve through the microscope, people were afraid to overturn Galen's theory. So despite seeing these little tubules, they still concluded that the tubules were hollow, allowing the flow of spiritual humor. And in fact, it took a medical student in 1755 who was brave enough to go against current dogma at the time and say that the, the, these fibers actually did not have a cavity inside them. And now we know that the optic nerve is very much like a cable, a telephone cable, or the wire that connects your iPhone to the brain, and that it sends multiple millions of messages through these little nerve fibers connecting the eye to the brain. And here at the top, you can see the histology of the optic nerve, and again, you can see the cable and see the remarkable resemblance between the two. The next step came for us to be able to look at the optic nerve in vivo or in the actual person. And this was happened through the development of the ophthalmoscope in the 1850s. With the development of the ophthalmoscope, the optic nerve became the only nerve in the body that could be looked at under physiological conditions. So if a neurosurgeon wants to see what they're interested in, they have to take out their Black & Decker and drill a hole through the skull. While as ophthalmologists, all we have to do is pick up the ophthalmoscope and we can see the nerve in action in, during life. And therefore, we have developed many different techniques and toys so that we can actually look at the optic nerve in three dimensions. 
But the next challenge came is how do we share what we're actually looking at? And this was primarily done through these sophisticated drawings, um, which we would do after we looked at the optic nerve. And of course, you can, I don't have to explain to you the limitations of, this, uh, uh, of these drawings. So the next major advance in ophthalmology came when to photography met ophthalmology, so that we can now take photographs of the back of the eye. And here you can see a photograph of the optic nerve. And therefore, we all knew what we were looking at, and we could share our knowledge. However, it soon became very clear that although we were all looking at the same thing, we all had very different interpretations of what we were looking at. And this kind of muddied a lot of the research that we were doing. In fact, studies have shown that ophthalmologists correlated with what they were looking at, as well as anglers who do, who are describing the same fish they caught. And it really did vary significantly from the very different perspectives that you came into things. So the next challenge was how do we measure objectively what we can see subjectively in these pictures? And this is where laser technology now meets ophthalmology. And with that came the new revolution and evolution of many of the techniques that we now use in our practice. So one is the Heidelberg retinal tomograph, which is a scanning laser camera which allows a three-dimensional quantitative image of the optic nerve from all 360 degrees. The other important technology is optical coherence tomography. And OCT, as we call it, uses light waves very similar to ultrasound using sound waves. So it allows us to look at and quantitatively measure the thickness of the optic nerve. And here at the University of Auckland, we've been using these technologies for various conditions. The first one is glaucoma. Glaucoma is the leading cause of preventable blindness. It affects one out of every 10 adults over the age of 70. The visual loss is silent until late in the disease, but once it occurs, it's irreversible. It occurs because of a, a problem with the drainage of fluid in the front of the eye, and this results in a buildup of pressure inside the eye. This pressure is then transmitted to the optic nerve, and then you, see, you get an excavation in the head of the nerve, and you can see that normally there's a nice shallow head to the optic nerve, but with a buildup of pressure, you get loss of nerve tissue in this excavation that occurs. As this excavation occurs of the nerve, you start to lose your peripheral nerve fibers first, and the world becomes darker, dimmer, and more constricted until ultimately you're left with very little uh, vision left in glaucoma. And this is an example of the OCT scan that we now can use in, to analyze and evaluate people with glaucoma. And what you can see up here are these black spots, or the blind spots, that are determined by a peripheral visual field test in someone. And you can see that with the OCT scan, we can measure microns of change in the optic nerve. So this is the head of the optic nerve as we look at it. And the areas of red are abnormal areas or areas where the tissue has been dropped out, and the areas of green or normal tissue. So now we can use this technology to monitor people with glaucoma and determine how they are deteriorating or if they're stable. And so here's an example of a patient who has, the, remember that hollowing that I described to you, and you can now look at the quantitative hollowing that we can now measure. And we can do this test every time they come and overlap their optic nerve on one visit from another and exquisitely tell them whether their treatment is accurate or where, whether it needs to be further intensified. So the advances in glaucoma meant with this technology, we can diagnose glaucoma earlier, we can identify deterioration earlier, and we can better differentiate between glaucoma and other disease that mimics it. But glaucoma is not the only area that we've used this technology. Because you have to remember, the optic nerve is the back of the eye, but it's also the front of the brain. So it allows us to look at a window of what's happening deep inside the brain. And our group here in Auckland was one of the first to try to use the optic nerve as a biomarker to see what's happening in various neurodegenerative disorders. And the first uh, group of pa patients we looked at were patients with Alzheimer's disease. And this is a, a graph uh, from our table, from our paper, and you can see that this 
here shows you the increase in the size of the optic cup or that excavation that I spoke about or the loss of nerve tissue. It's a surrogate for loss of nerve tissue. So you can see as you lose nerve tissue in the optic nerve, the mini mental status examination, or which is the score of the severity of glaucoma, the lower the number, the more uh, the severity of the Alzheimer's, the lower the number, the more severe the disease. You can see that this is severity of Alzheimer's and that's loss of tissue. So the more nerve tissue, we were able to show the more nerve tissue you lose in the optic nerve correlates with the severity of the Alzheimer's disease. And this was the first study that was able to show the optic nerve can be used as a biomarker for neurodegenerative disease. Since then, many investigators internationally have also been looking at this in various other conditions. And in fact, the FDA now requires in multiple sclerosis for an OCT scan to be done in all these patients to help monitor disease with any new treatments that are being developed. And here in Auckland, we're looking at uh, Huntington's chorea, frontotemporal dementia, and also brain tumors and the role of OCT in these studies. So, why brain tumors? It's because brain tumors can cause blindness because the optic nerve extends deep into the brain. And you can see from this yellow diagram here, those are the pathway fibers of the optic nerve and their extensions, which extend all the way to the back of the brain. So a brain tumor, as you see in the other uh, neuroimaging slide, does push on the optic nerve fibers and can cause blindness. So one possible area we wanted to look at is can we use this technology to predict if someone is going to recover from their vision after, uh, when they have a brain tumor after they undergo surgery? But what we noticed, and in fact it was noticed internationally, is if you look back at this visual field test, you can see that all these black spots here are someone's blind spots. So they can't see when they have all these blind spots. But look at the OCT. It's green. And you will remember I told you that red is bad, green is good. So how can someone who has this have, the, have this technology? So the traditional interpretation was the, the machine is limited. The technology is limited because it doesn't allow you to interpret what's happening into the brain. But here in Auckland, we looked at it differently. We said that maybe this is a clue to whether the person is going to recover or not. And so in our paper, what we did is we correlated those who recover from vision following surgery with their OCT. And we found that if they have a healthy retinal nerve fiber layer or an optic nerve prior to surgery as measured by the OCT, even if they were blind, their chances of recovery were excellent. And you can see that's from these group of patients here who recovered. While those who had a poor retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and were blind didn't change much in their post-operative tests, and therefore they didn't recover. So I will end with this 39-year-old woman who is 24 weeks pregnant, because she came in uh, towards the end of the study just as soon as we had made this observation. And so she had this um, significant tumor, which, and the question was really whether she should have surgery at 24 weeks pregnant or whether she should wait. And this was her OCT. So you can see it was green. So we uh, discussed with the neurosurgeons and we said, we think she's fine. She has time. You can wait a few weeks and let the baby develop because the optic nerve fibers are not stressed. So they waited six weeks so the baby could be more fully developed. And then this is the change in her vision that we saw after the surgery. And then three months afterwards, she can came into the post-operative check with a very healthy baby and a very normal visual field. So in conclusion, longer life expectancy is associated with greater needs in maintaining quality of life. And vision is critical to maintaining this quality of life. Technological advances in ophthalmology allow earlier diagnosis and more precise management of conditions that occur in aging and cause blindness. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I'm sure, again, there'll be many more questions for Helen um, once we conclude. But we're now going to our final speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Martin Connolly. Uh, Martin trained in medicine at Newcastle-upon-Tyne in the UK, and he qualified 
in 1980. He was for 15 years consultant physician at Manchester Royal Infirmary and senior lecturer in geriatric medicine at the University of Manchester. He was appointed as Freemasons Professor of Geriatric Medicine at Auckland and geriatrician at Waitemata DHB in 2006. Martin's research centres around healthcare provision for older people, with emphasis on those living in residential aged care and in retirement village, villages. He has published over 130 peer-reviewed original research papers, and last month he became a New Zealand citizen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm hoping that my voice will hold out because I'm full of cold and sore throat. So. The consequences. That sounds bad, doesn't it? The pros and the consequences. Um, I'm hoping to present, or continue to present, an optimistic view rather than a pessimistic one. It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. <laughs> First line of Pride and Prejudice, 1813, Jane Austen. What's that got to do with the demog demography of ageing? Well, quite a lot. Jane died four years later at the ripe young age of 41. Great loss to English literature, but as you've already seen, not particularly epidemiologically surprising. Um, this line, that you've, this graph that you've already seen, uh, if you follow it further back, it plateaus at around about 41, from about 1817 backwards. So 1817, the average age of death in, in England, where Jane died, was 41. So, I hope I'm not going to insult people here. Hands up, please, if you are 41 years old or younger. Keep your hands up. Hands up, please, if you're 42 years old or older. <laughs> so everybody should now have their hands up. Good. Keep, no, keep them up. Keep them up. Keep, put them down if you're in the first group and you hope you die before you're 42. <laughs> put them down if you're in the second group and you wish you'd died before you were 42. <laughs> so you've all still got your hands up. If you are in those, either of those groups, and you have concerns that demographic ageing is a problem, you are the epidemiological equivalent of a NIMBY, not in my backyard. You know that sewerage running through the streets is a bad thing, but you don't want a sewerage farm next door to your house. You know, and you think, that ageing of the population might be causing problems, but you don't want to die young. You're a NIMBY, so am I. I therefore say to you, is a truth which should be universally acknowledged, that the so-called demographic time bomb is in fact man's greatest achievement. Because nobody in this room wants to die at 41 or younger. Demographic time bomb, silver tsunami, grey tsunami. If you, if you Google just those three terms, you get 90 million a bit Google hits. Is this the object of giddy conspiracism and internet myth-making, as uh, Simon Sebo and Montefiore said about Jerusalem? Or are these legitimate concerns? Before we go on to talk about that, just a few examples of people who died young by today's standards in times past. Think what they could have done had they lived another 10 or 20 or 30 years longer. And a few examples of people who did live a bit longer, uh, either by their standards at the time or by, by modern standards, and did great things when they were older. So Churchill was war prime minister until he was 71. And Nelson Mandela, who, uh, whose birth anniversary, 100th anniversary was yesterday, was 73 at the end of apartheid. Is that a glass half empty or is it half full? This is my oldest son, Robert, with his glass half empty or half full. Notice it's a beer glass, not a milk glass. Um, Robert's an engineer. And engineers would say, is the glass twice the size it needs to be? <laughs> That's not a perfect analogy, um, but it does suggest that uh, the problem may not be quite as simple as the, the glass half being half full or half empty. If only it were. UK tobacco tax in 2016 raised £13 billion. When 70% of people smoked, my working lifetime, as you've already heard, tobacco tax is equated at today's equivalent of £52 billion to smoking-related healthcare costs in the UK. 
on those costs and the, the total healthcare costs, not just smoking related, uh, were, was 116 billion in 2016. But also, they saved pensions at 92 billion <laughs> and social care costs at 17 billion because the age of death in smokers in 1980 was 66 and the age of death in the average population, including smokers, was 75. Now most people don't smoke. If they did, we wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> the modern equivalent is fat tax. Fat tax has been brought in in the UK and brought out again because everybody hated it. Sugar tax has just been brought in. Everybody hates that. Uh, and that's probably going to go. We've not tried salt tax yet. Perhaps we should think about that one too. But it isn't simple. Um, I'm going to show quite a few slides from work that have been done in my department uh, by uh, a team of us. Um, many people in that team. Uh, I'd like to particularly acknowledge Jill Broad, who's part of that team, uh, Dr. Jill Broad, and she's present here today. And um, this is one of her slides. Um, the number of the problem, or the number of the perceived problem, is that as we get older, the number of chronic medical conditions that we have gets greater. So if you, when you're 20, on average, or 20 year olds on average, 80% of them have no chronic conditions at all, thank heavens. Uh, and only 15% or less have one chronic condition. But by the time you get to 80, 15% of people have six or more chronic conditions. Uh, and less than 10% have none at all. We've heard, heard a bit about uh, healthy lifespan versus unhealthy lifespan. And we've heard it from Alistair in terms of disability and dependency. Another way of looking at healthy lifespan and unhealthy lifespan is morbidity, illnesses, what symptoms. Um, and the jury's out, really, whether, um, whether in terms of illnesses and symptoms, as opposed to dependency, we are compressing morbidity. I don't know what expect to go into the details of looking at this, but um, <clears throat> there is some evidence in some countries, this is UK data, there's some evidence in some countries that we are compressing morbidity, so we're having a longer lifespan being healthy. There's some evidence in other countries that we're not. But in, in any case, in, either country, in any country, there's not a lot of movement in terms of, in terms of compression or morbidity. This is New Zealand data, another study that I was involved in. Uh, and uh, this is a prevalence of the most cr common medical conditions in very old people, 80 to 90 year olds, Maori and non-Maori, in the North Island of New Zealand. Uh, and these are the conditions, high blood pressure and heart disease and heart failure. You know, not a, no, they're pretty nasty conditions that you wouldn't want to have. And these are the percentage of people in each of these groups with them. So quite a lot of, <coughs> quite a lot of morbidity. Note the relatively low prevalence of dementia in this very advanced age group. Perhaps a bit more of that later. So, another show of hands. What proportion of these very old people described their health as poor? Was it, hands up, 50%? Was it 35%? Hands up. Was it 20%? Was it 10%? It was 7 to 8%. And when you ask them to compare that to people of their own age, it was 1% to 2%. And 45% of these people, with all these horrible, symptomatic things wrong with them, said their health was good or excellent. <laughs> and you may be surprised, and we, were, we weren't surprised, because this is replicated by lots of international data that says the same thing. Another study from Belgium. Note, I'm not biased. They beat us in the World Cup, but I'm still going to talk about their study. Um, this is 131 people with a median age of 83, ranging from 80 to 90 years old, who had been admitted to the intensive care unit because they were very sick, and they'd not died, and they'd survived to be discharged from hospital. And they were surveyed three months after discharge, a year after discharge, and seven years after discharge. Their one-year mortality was 50%, and their seven-year mortality was 84%. Not surprisingly, because they were pretty old, and they'd been very, very sick. Um, they, should, they themselves felt their, their, their disability and dependency had increased over time, and indeed nearly 40% of them, by, by the time they got to seven years of the survivors, were living in rest homes or private hospitals. There was an overall decrease in quality of life, they told us, or they told the investigators, as reported by them on a validated, um, validated quality of life scales. However, quality of life was still regarded as acceptable by all of them. 20 of 21 seven-year survivors were glad to be alive. 82% of one-year survivors and 72% of seven-year survivors would say, said, if I was sick again, I'd want to go back to ICU. These are very old people. Remember, the oldest was 97 by the time they got to the seven years. 
So compression or uh, comorbidity might be a bridge to, or a step too far. Should we be happy, as older people seem to be, with maintenance of comorbidity? I'm not saying we should, I'm just posing the question. So what are our chances, we've been hearing about this already, of living to 85 or 90? Well, life expectancy at birth, 78 for men and 82 for women in New Zealand, is not the same as life expectancy at 60 or 65, and that's called the survivor effect. So this is a slightly complicated slide. These are people of a certain age, 70 or 75 or 95. This is how many, life, how many years of life you've got left when you are 70. Forget the, just look at the, 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 the medium color blue thing. This is, the, this is the average, the median. So on average, if you're a man in New Zealand and you're 70, you can expect to live another 17.2 years. But if you get to 85, 15 years later, you don't, can't expect to live another 2.2 years, you can live, expect to live another 5.5 years. And it goes on and goes on and goes on, so theoretically, mathematically, we all live forever, but it's not quite as simple as that. <laughs> Um, but that's, that's, that's um, the survivor effect. And we've already heard, we've already seen uh, this from Alistair in a, a non-graphical form. Most of that increased expectat expectation of longevity currently is in older people. So you don't stand much, much, much greater chance of making it to 65 than, you, than your contemporary, your, your, than people 50 years older than us did 50 years ago. But if you make it to 65, you stand a much greater chance of living to 75 or 85 or 95. So it really is all these older people that are living longer. Um, this is a very recent study, just published this year, uh, that shows that if you get beyond 100, your chances of dying in the next year are less than the chances of an average 90-year-old dying in the next year. <laughs> these are super survivors. These are the really hyper-fit people that make it to 100. And there's a very, you've already heard, there's a very major socioeconomic effect. So my daughter here is 28, um, from a high socioeconomic group, stands a better than 50, 50, 50 chance of living to 90. And my granddaughter, her niece, uh, who is three now, she wasn't three then, uh, also from a high socioeconomic group, stands a better than 50, 50 chance of living to 95. But improvements do come with potential problems, and I'd like to introduce the term dependency ratio to you. This is a well-recognized international term. Note the loaded terminology, dependency. The dependency ratio is for every 100 people in the population aged 15 to 64, which are said to be the productive people, how many dependent people are there? How many kids under 15 and how many adults over 65? Um, and I'd just like to talk about the adults over 65. So currently in New Zealand, for every 100 people aged 15 to, 20, aged 15 to 64, there are 23 people over 65. But by the, in the working lifetime of our, of our current medical students, that number will have doubled. So there'll be 45, roughly, uh, over 65-year-olds for every uh, person of productive age. <laughs> but are they really dependent? In New Zealand, almost 35% of over 65 are in paid work and 20% do voluntary work. The net intergenerational transfer, older to younger, of money does not reverse until the older generation gets to 82. So why? Because we, uh, we older people, uh, give our kids deposits for their houses or loan them and do we expect to get it back? Well, perhaps we do, perhaps we don't. Um, and we look after their kids for free, we look after our grandchildren, babysitting for free, etc. Um, and we've paid, paid their student loans or paid their university fees, and we don't expect to get that back either. 90% of the caring of so-called dependent, uh, and indeed these people are, uh, dependent, old, very old people, is carried out by their families. So they may be dependent, but they don't depend on the state. And 50% of that is carried out by their spouses. So they may be dependent, but they're not dependent on the younger generation. So there's lots of buts in the term dependency ratio. However, what is, what is uh, not a but is that the number of acute medical, medical hospitalizations, medical and surgical hospitalizations, unexpected, I don't mean you go in for your routinely expected operation, the number of acute unexpected operations in the over 85s, this is the red line, has doubled in a relatively short period of time. This is the northern region, the four northern DHBs from Northland down to Counties Manukau. And for every one person that was admitted to hospital as an emergency, aged over 85 in 1999, there were just over two people admitted in 2009, 11 years later. 
New Zealand is very generous when it comes to healthcare expenditure, but it's very old. This is just healthcare expenditure. This is slightly old data. For every dollar New Zealand spends on uh, healthcare of people under the age of 65, it spends six dollars on people over the age of 75. And in relative terms, that's the highest in the OECD, even higher than the states, for example. And the bottom line is we spend 41% of our public health expenditure on the 15% of the population currently 65 and over. That doesn't sound good, does it? When we're going to get lots more people aged 65 and over. Well, here's the good news, guys. What this actually equates to is that we use most of our personal health care expenditure in the last year or two of our lives, trying to keep us alive, at whatever age we die. So if you die at 41, you use most of the, your personal lifetime healthcare expenditure between the age of 39 and 41. If you died at 101, 99 to 101. And beyond a certain age, and that age depends on the jurisdiction where you're living, the older we are when we die, the less, is, the less actual money is spent on us trying to keep us alive. So this is the EU. Uh, and this is uh, increasing age, and this is money spent trying to keep people alive, uh, 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 the total lifetime healthcare expenditure. And as you see, it drops at about 87. That's the EU. Other countries, it's 85, others, it's 89. But it's, 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 it falls off. So it's cheaper for healthcare for people to live longer. Not for everything care, but for healthcare. Further problems for the future medical advances, more can be done, more should be done. New older generations have increased expectations anyway. Further reductions in ageism will increase costs further. So when I was a registrar in 1990, if you were 66 and you had a heart attack, you couldn't go to coronary care. You were too old. If you were 66 and your kidneys failed and you needed renal dialysis, tough, you were too old. That's what I mean by ageism in healthcare. We don't have that now, but we still have some. So I explained all this to my, my, one of my, my other son, got all my kids into this thing, um, who, uh, this is Simon, he was then aged 11, he's now 22 and 6 foot 2 and hates me showing this slide. And I explained it in slightly simpler terms and I said, so Simon, what do we think for the future? And that was his answer. <laughs> I think he was wrong. We don't know what we don't know when we don't know it. So this is a map of the world in 1750. Very accurate, what we knew about. Bit missing, bit missing, lot missing. This is a map of the world, of course, drawn in Europe. This is the Royal Victoria Infirmary uh, in Newcastle upon Tyne, where I train. Pavilion Ward, the ward is called Pavilion One. This is 1911. I was not, I'm not in the picture, that is not me. Um, it looked a bit like that in 1981 when I worked there, but it doesn't look like that now. Hospital wards do not look like this anymore. Medical care is advancing, and it always has. I love this quote. This is the first time anybody in the world that we know of ever said that doing research is a good thing. Seneca, the Roman philosopher. Here's another one of Joe Broad's slides. Um, as, how many people in New Zealand are living in residential aged care? What are your chances of living in res rest homes and private hospitals as you age? Well, one way of me measuring that, a very accurate way, is where you are physically located, geographically located, at the time that you die. And in New Zealand, if you die over the age of 85, there's a 55% chance that you are physically, geographically, in a rest home or a private hospital when you die. We're only just overtaken by Iceland uh, on that, that table, on that graph. Uh, and this, you can see in other OECD countries, there's a wide range. New Zealand is very good at institutionalizing its older people. Um, but it's getting better. So this is another study that I was involved in, uh, with, uh, including Joe, but many other, many other people on this study. Um, we were involved in this one, 2008. Uh, this is the Opal study. And this is Greater Auckland, the three Auckland DHBs. These are, this is, happens to be for people over the, over the age of 85, people over the age of 94. So for every 100 people in Greater Auckland, in that age group, in 1988, 43 of them, if they were women, lived in a rest home or a private hospital. By 2008, that had fallen to 27. Same for men, same for other age groups. I'm only showing the one slide. Busy slide, but just look at this line here. This is the actual number of rest home and private hospital places available in those four years spread over 20 years. No change, despite the fact that there had been a 43% increase in the uh, population over the age of 65. 
people were older living in residential aged care, and they were more disabled, so they were, they were less mobile, um, and they were on many more drugs than they had been 20 years ago. Is all that a bad thing? Well, no. Residents were entering residential aged care later in life, and only when they were more disabled. They were staying independent in their own homes for longer, and that's where they want to be. Uh, they're also not occupying hospital beds. So this is the time they entered residential aged care. For the fir on the first day they entered residential aged age care, this is a year before, ha before that time. This is a year after that time. This is the chances of acute hospitalisation. Each of the dots represents a week. And as you can see, increasing chance, particularly in that last six months, before they move into a rest home or a private hospital, as soon as they enter, trans drops off, the, off a cliff. So it isn't all these old people in rest homes that are blocking the medical beds in hospitals. Pensions. Bismarck. Germany. New Zealand 10 years later. UK 10 years after that. UK pension in current terms then was $30 a week and it was given to those over 65 when the average age of death was 59. Not many people got a pension. <laughs> if we were equally, gen equally generous as UK liberals 100 years ago, we'd start to pay pensions at about 90. <laughs> Not a great idea. Um, but even a slight increase in the pension age is not going to be very popular and probably not very fair to manual workers. But pensions take up a very high proportion of spending on older people. Um, housing occupancy has fallen uh, in New Zealand quite dramatically. It's not fallen as much in older people, but it has fallen in younger older people, not in the very old as yet. Why is that relevant? Because... The amount of pension that New Zealand and any other country pays to people, older people, is mitigated or is, is uh, affected by the assumption that they don't have to pay rent because they own their own homes. They don't have to pay a mortgage because they paid it off. And in fact, that's less likely to be true. Pensions are rising anyway, even in the crash. There is a current transfer of family capital to the state and the private sector. Retirement bill is all going to Y, and some people have to pay rest home and private hospital costs. And thus resentment has arisen in younger generations. Where's all the money going? Well, you got free education, we have to pay for it. But older people have paid their taxes and their superannuation for a long time, and those taxes and superannuation have actually built up the healthcare system and the social care system that we currently have. These things do not happen straight away overnight. So a reasonable question might be, do we agree with Margaret Thatcher, who said in 1980, there is no such thing as society? I very rarely find myself agreeing with Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> but, I hear you ask, what about dementia? Well, you've already heard. Um, so I won't do the show of hands, because you know the answer. Um, this, is, this is the actual data from, that, from the studies that Alistair was referring to. Uh, two studies, both published recent, both publishers of was one paper in The Lancet in 2013, uh, data from the UK. The prevalence of dementia in 85 to, 89, 85 to 90 year olds, essentially, 20 years, to, uh, 25 years ago, was, was 20% uh, in, in men, and it formed to 30%, 13% 20 years later. And in women, it was 27%, and it formed to 18% 20 years later. That was a massive fall. It was a 35% fall in the age-specific prevalence of dementia uh, in that period in the UK. Why might that be? We've heard various reasons why that might be, but an important reason is the fall in vascular risk, smoking, high blood pressure, control of cholesterol, reducing the risk of stroke and heart disease, but also reducing the risk of vascular dementia. 25% of dementia is due, we think, or we used to think, to uh, lots of little mini strokes, um, impairing uh, brain function. But if it's only 25% of dementia that's caused by that, even if you eliminate all of it, how can you get a 35% reduction in the prevalence of dementia? Well, we now think that Alzheimer's disease, uh, in order to become manifest, doesn't just need those proteins that you were hearing about earlier on to be deposited in the brain. Yes, it needs those before you get Alzheimer's disease, but it also needs, we think, an unhealthy arterial blood supply to the brain. So if you eliminate or reduce vascular risk, you also reduce Alzheimer's disease risk. If so, then again, as we've already heard, there are some concerns in the future regarding obesity and diabetes and vascular risk. So, evolution versus revolution. So, mapping Europe and mapping uh, Africa was evolution. It happened gradually. Europeans finding this bit of the world was revolution. Europeans finding this bit of the world was revolution. Fleming finding penicillin was revolution. We need another Fleming. 
when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. We can't do it all with evolution. It's probable and increasingly likely that, most, that many of us will live to be 100, or possibly our kids or our grandkids 110, 120. Should we want to? Do we want to? Is our perspective at least partially dependent on society's perspective? Started with the first line, famous one. Here's another famous one. Charles Dickens, Tale of Two Cities. Best of times, worst of times, spring of hope, winter of despair. Take your choice. Do you believe in hope or despair? This lady believed in hope. This is Jean Calment, who died in 1997 at the age of 120 and a half. She was the oldest person that we know with a birth certificate to prove it. She knew Vincent van Gogh. She described him as a dirty, smelly, unpleasant individual. <laughs> she started fencing, on guard fencing, at the age of 85. She was still cycling on a pedal cycle in Paris at the age of 100. If you think Auckland traffic's bad, you should drive in Paris. When she was just about, or just approaching her 120th birthday, she was interviewed by a junior reporter from Le Figaro in uh, France, a fr French news national newspaper, about the secrets of a healthy and long life. Red wine, garlic, all that sort of thing. At the end of the interview, he stood up and said, so do you think, Madame Carmel, I'll be coming to see you again next year when you're 121? And she looked at him and she said, I don't see why not, young man. You look quite fit to me. <laughs> Thank you.